A three-judge panel from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City unanimously ruled today that the NSA's program collecting millions of phone records is not authorized by the Patriot Act and exceeds the scope of what Congress authorized in the law. The court did not address the constitutionality of the program or whether people's privacy rights are being violated. The Patriot Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by President George W. Bush Uh, October 2001 in the aftermath of the uh, 9-11 terrorist attacks. Next, it's the oral argument in the case that was ruled on today from last September. It runs just under an hour and 50 minutes. Okay, please be seated, everyone. Good morning again. Uh, We're about to proceed to hear uh, the case of American Civil Liberties Union versus Clapper. Uh, I thought I would say one thing. This case apparently is of sufficient uh, interest that uh, it's uh, being broadcast. Uh, I don't know who is going to watch it, if anyone, uh, but uh, to the extent that it's going to be watched by people who aren't lawyers and aren't familiar with appellate argument, uh, I thought I'd just say one thing about what is not likely to be seen here. Uh, This case is about uh, the bulk data uh, collection uh, program operated by the National Security Agency. Uh, What uh, viewers are about to see is not a uh, debate uh, on the merits of that program and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, That's for two reasons. Uh, One, as a matter of substance, the issues before us uh, start with legal issues about whether this court uh, even has the jurisdiction to resolve any or all of the questions raised by the uh, plaintiffs. Uh, and then continue, the questions raised by the plaintiffs uh, are not about whether the program is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but about whether it's been authorized uh, or or perhaps forbidden by specific statutory provisions of Congress uh, and by specific uh, provisions of the Constitution of the United States. That's what's before us. Uh, It's also not a debate as a matter of form. Uh, uh, The uh, procedure here is going to involve lawyers making arguments, uh, they're likely to be interrupted and asked a lot of questions by the judges. Uh, That's not because we're rude or because we don't want them to uh, make their case in an uninterrupted manner. They've already had the opportunity to present in writing uh, their positions in an uninterrupted manner. Uh, This is to some degree our time uh, to ask questions of the lawyers to clarify the points that they're making and the implications of those uh, uh, points uh, to perhaps raise issues that haven't been fully addressed by the parties uh, and to give each side the opportunity and indeed the obligation uh, to not just say their best points but to respond to the best points uh, of the other side. Uh, so it's not uh, going to be a, uh, a sort of free-ranging debate where everybody gets to say everything they want about these programs. Uh, it, it's going to be much more uh, limited than uh, that. Uh, All right, Uh, so I don't know whether that was useful or not. It's certainly not useful to any of the lawyers here who already know what's going to happen. Mr. Abdo, you may proceed. And you have reserved some time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, and may it please the court. Every day, the NSA collects records of the phone calls made by millions. as, as the presider threatened, I'm going to interrupt you at the outset because I have two questions that are essentially questions of fact. <clears throat> and I find it kind of difficult to approach this argument without, uh, without understanding that at the outset. One is that as I read them, and I did read them, uh, in some cases more than once, it's not clear to me 
whether emails are covered by this program or not. Now, it's possible that's a big secret as to whether they are or not. But I don't know, sitting here, whether I can get a hold of, you know, all my mistresses and say, hey, let's just do it by email because the government can't watch. Uh, I'm sure my wife isn't going to watch this program. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I'm terribly serious about the question of, of what, it, insofar as we're allowed to know, uh, you're allowed to know, are emails covered and to what extent? That's the first question. Maybe you can answer that. Emails are not covered by this program. This program solely concerns uh, records of phone calls made by Americans every day. Uh, the government has operated programs in the past under similar interpretations of the meaning of relevance that allow it to collect the same information for emails, uh, but that's not what this case concerns. All right. So, okay. So we don't, in the, we, we cannot take into account one way or the other whether somebody can say, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, Lord knows I mean this very seriously, uh, that, that can say to uh, a co-conspirator of, uh, uh, of some sort, well, let's just use emails. I don't use the phone anymore anyhow. I think the court can take that into account when it considers the breadth of the government's interpretation uh, of the word relevance and of the grand jury limitation in Section 215. And I think the court can take it into account when it considers the breadth of the government's interpretation uh, of Smith and, uh, and Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Because that would be because it's your position that if the government is correct here, then Congress has authorized the same sort of order, the same sort of order could be made with respect to everyone's bank records in the country. That's exactly right. If Section 215 permits bulk collection, uh, then bulk collection would be permitted not just for phone records, but for any records. It would be permitted not just under Section 215, but under every run-of-the-mill subpoena statute, and not just in the context of terrorism investigations, uh, but in the context of investigations of essentially any crime involving more than one person. Let me, let me ask this, though. If the data remained in the possession of the telephone companies, and the government sought, and it may be through tens or hundreds of subpoenas, to get the same information that they're basically gathering by using the queries against the database the government has collected, would that be constitutional? The, the government has that authority now under a number of statutes, and we don't challenge the government's ability to issue targeted demands for records from the telephone companies or from any other company. But you're, that's not, when you say targeted demands, are you saying because the government, because they are, have a number uh, that the FBI or whatever organization comes in and says, we have a number that we have uh, uh, RAS for, um, we are, want the phone companies to apply this number across the data set that would be the data set, assuming it's the data set, same data set um, that the government currently has. I'm asking, in, is it your position that that is constitutional or unconstitutional? It would be constitutional for the government to issue a targeted demand for a limited set of data, as it has always done. Uh, what is unconstitutional about this program, I think, are several things. First is that the government is collecting in bulk everything at the outset in a way that has never been permitted, uh, either as a statutory matter or as a constitutional matter. Uh, and second, once the government has that information uh, in its possession, it runs queries on, on that data. Uh, but our principal complaint is about the government's collection of that information. Yeah, but that, that raises what I said was going to be my second question, and that is there appears throughout this, and particularly, I mean, this, this case was brought, was begun uh, less than a week after the disclosure of the program, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And there's been a fair amount of water under the bridge since then. And well, uh, the, 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 and the, what we refer to technically as the red brief, which is to say the government's brief, uh, they mentioned three things. Uh, uh, one, if I remember, the number of hops, that is uh, two degrees of separation rather than three, and also having to get the FISA court's approval before entering a query, at least that's generally my understanding is the second thing that's done and has been done already. And the third thing is this notion that they're going to go back. They, they haven't yet, but they're, they're going to go back to Congress. And they're going to say, no more. We're, we don't want to do this anymore. We want to keep all this information in the hands of the service providers and, uh, and not 
instead of and being able to query them in one way or another, and I gather that's not a simple thing to do, but we're going to take this out of uh, um, out of the hands of the government and out of the the data will no longer be sitting there in the hands of the government. It's going to be put back where it started and will be queried from there. Uh, is the, if they if that was done, if Congress were to pass such a law. Would that essentially end the controversy here? I mean, and, and there's a kind of a technical question as to what, what your standing might be if they did that. But leaving that aside, I would, I would have thought, having read that, that if they did what the president said in March they were going to do, you would have embraced it and said, yeah, that's, what, that's why we started this. You would, I can't I'm apologize, but I think of, of Senator uh, Aiken many, what, 40 some odd years ago saying, you know, declare uh, victory and withdraw, right? We would love if the government ended the bulk collection of Americans' phone records. And if the government did that, and it also purged our records from the databases it currently has, that would uh, resolve, I think, everything put in place, uh, put at issue by our preliminary injunction motion. But that is not the current state of affairs. Okay. And I think it would yeah, be. Go ahead. Continue, I'm sorry, yeah. please. And, and I think it would be uh, 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 maybe unwise to expect Congress, uh, this Congress or the next, to act uh, in that way so soon. There are two bills, one before the House, mm -hmm. one before uh, the Senate. Uh, they have differences, they haven't yet reconciled those differences, and there are only a handful of days left in the legislative session. Uh, of, the, of this term. I understand they're thinking of other things at the moment. Yeah. Right. And, and I should say that, you know, the, the injury is ongoing on a daily basis. Uh, and even if Congress acts in several months, we're entitled to a remedy today for the violations that continue and, and are ongoing. Okay. So if, if I may, I'll, I'll return, I, I suppose, where I was going to begin um, with the statute, uh, which is, I think, offers a narrower ground for decision. Um, we essentially have two positions under Section 215. Well, it would offer a narrower ground for decision, except that the government insists that we don't have jurisdiction to reach the statutory issues uh, because uh, Congress has uh, precluded implicitly what uh, would normally be our jurisdiction under the Administrative Procedure Act. That's right. And so I, think the government I assume is, you're going to address that. I, I am going to address that. I think the government is wrong on that score for a couple of reasons. First. Uh, the APA creates a strong presumption of judicial review for injunctive claims challenging illegal agency conduct. And that presumption can only be overcome if there's clear and convincing evidence that Congress intended to preclude uh, the injunctive claims, such as the ones we bring here. And there simply isn't that evidence. Uh, the government points first to Section 2712 of the Sword Communications Act, but that statute by its very terms is preclusive only as to claims within its purview. Uh, but Section 215 is simply not within the purview of Section uh, 2712 of the Sword Communications Act. It applies to several unrelated subchapters uh, of FISA, and not even the government contends uh, that it applies, at least as a textual matter, uh, to our claims here. Uh, the government also argues uh, that Section 215 itself implicitly precludes our claims. But the Supreme Court has made clear time and again that Congress is ex uh, providing for a cause of action for one class of plaintiffs does not in and of itself uh, deprive other plaintiffs of, of, a, of a cause of action. If that were the case, then the presumption of review under the APA, uh, as Justice Scalia said in Sackett versus EPA, would not be much of a presumption at all. Instead, the question turns on one of congressional intent. What did Congress intend when it enacted uh, 215? And on that score, I think the legislative record is clear. Uh, Congress enacted the recipient review procedures of 215 uh, after a district uh, court in the Southern District of New York had invalidated the National Security Letter Statute because it failed to provide for a clear avenue for review uh, for recipients of national security letters. Congress fixed that problem in 2006, and it similarly provided in the same legislation uh, review for recipients of Section 215 orders. But it made no provision at all, or, or rather it spoke not at all about review Perhaps the presider would make clear how we're going to deal with the red light after 12 minutes. I should say. Yes, I think we're. we're <laughs> this is clearly a matter that uh, uh, will go on as long as at least we find it uh, valuable to go on. I, 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 sh I should warn you. I went on uh, the C-SPAN uh, um, um, website, which that technical I am, 
uh, and I went on the purpose of finding out what C-SPAN stands for, which I'd be happy to share with you at another time. <laughs> but I, I found out that they, unlike what it says here, they have set aside two hours for this broadcast. <laughs> So we will, we will uh, uh, go on at greater length. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I think what I was saying is that uh, the legislative history of Section 215 makes clear that the recipient review procedures uh, did not decide the question at all about whether Congress uh, wanted the targets of 215 orders uh, to have available uh, statutory review. And in that context, where the legislative intent uh, is, cannot be discerned, the default rule of the APA governs and provides for injunctive relief. And, and, and with respect to the, uh, the government makes an argument further that no one would have anticipated a lawsuit like this, that is one brought by someone whose records were demanded because the intent was that people in your position would never even know that this was going on. Uh, does, does that mean that Congress didn't uh, anticipate this kind of lawsuit or intended to preclude this kind of lawsuit? No, and this is a point on which we disagree with the government. Congress clearly provided for the possibility that targets of 215 orders would learn about those orders. It contemplated that recipients would have a right to challenge the gag orders imposed upon uh, their ability to tell their customers about, uh, about the orders and that they might, in due course, tell their customers. So I think Congress clearly contemplated uh, that uh, targets would learn, uh, that it did not then go on to preclude whatever claims it might have wanted to preclude, uh, I think speaks clearly that Congress simply had uh, no view that, on the matter. You're talking about recipients, which is the service companies, and not individuals whose records were being uh, collected, is that right? I, I'm talking about the gag orders imposed on recipients by Section 215. Those recipients can challenge those gag order provisions. I uh, and I, I think the and if fact they win, then a um, person whose records were at issue would learn of it. That's exactly right. And, and I think there's something you know, a bit bizarre about the government's arguments. It attributes to Congress the intent to deprive this court uh, of a narrower path for decision. Because not even the government contends that our constitutional claims are precluded. And there's no question that this court will have to, at the very least, resolve our constitutional claims. So the only consequence of the government's claim of preclusion uh, is that the narrower ground for decision would not be available to it. I think that's a very strange intent to attribute to Congress, uh, and, and there's not really a coherent theory offered by the government on why Congress would have wanted to preclude our statutory claims, knowing full well that our constitutional ones uh, could proceed. That's assuming that Congress actually gave that thought at the time. I mean, I, I'm not sure that that necessarily would, would be, the, be the case, but if it, when you're talking about the, uh, the statute, Congress did address the issue of the recipients. And they didn't say recipients and others. Is there anything to suggest um, that Congress at the time of, they were dealing with recipients thought about others possibly having the ability uh, to challenge the statute? I don't think there's anything in the legislative history. And, and that, I think, uh, is fatal to the government's claim, because in that situation, where there's no intent decipherable one way or the other, the background uh, rule of the APA controls. And I think it's important to point out that when Congress amended Section 215 to add the recipient review procedures, uh, it asked the government its view of the necessity of those procedures. And the government went to Congress and said, we think as a statutory matter that those that there is already a, an avenue for judicial review for recipients of these orders. Uh, that was their position in the litigation over the national security letter statute, uh, and that was also their position in Congress. They said, we don't think that clarification of the law is necessary, but we welcome it because it does no harm. Uh, it, it, it clarifies the species of judicial review that the government had already told the district court was available, uh, available to recipients of these sorts uh, of orders. So Congress was really just addressing that narrow, that narrow problem uh, of the of it being potentially unconstitutional for Congress not to have provided ready judicial review for recipients. So your, your basic argument with respect to the secrecy point, or at least an argument with respect to the secrecy point, uh, is that if Congress didn't imagine that this thing was ever likely to happen, assuming that I understand you have an argument that uh, they should have foreseen this possibility in at least some contingent circumstances, but if they didn't think about this at all, uh, then you win. 
uh, because they're already, it, we're not looking for evidence of a legislative intent to create a right to judicial review. Your position is that's already there under the APA, unless there is evidence of a judicial intent, of a congressional intention to preclude uh, judicial review. Is that? That's exactly right. Okay. That's the presumption created by the APA. Uh, the way that Your Honor articulated it is the way that the Supreme Court has articulated it uh, time and again, and that is the government's burden in this case. Uh, to show by clear and convincing evidence that Congress intended to preclude our claims, uh, not uh, our burden to demonstrate that Congress intended uh, to create them. Uh, so if I may, I'll move on to then the, the, the merits of our, our statutory claim. Um, so as I said before, our, our first claim is that uh, Section 215 simply does not apply to call records. In the very same statute that Congress enacted Section 215 uh, in 2001, it added a provision to the Stored Communications Act prohibiting the government from acquiring phone records. It created exceptions to that prohibition, uh, but Section 215 is not among the list uh, of those exceptions. That's critical because under settled, uh, uh, under settled principles of statutory construction, uh, the specific prohibition in the Stored Communications Act supersedes the very general grant of authority under Section 215. And indeed, in the past, the government has agreed with that very principle. Uh, when they were confronted by a senator who worried that the privacy protections of the Census Act might yield to Section 215, the Department of Justice assured uh, that senator that the privacy protections in the Census Act uh, would not yield, that they trumped, in effect, uh, the general authority of Section 215. And they've agreed with a related proposition, which is that the exceptions in the Stored Communications Act are exclusive that it is not for courts and it is not for the government to infer additional exceptions not already created by Congress to the background rule of privacy uh, established by the Stored Communications Act. That was the government's official position in a, an OLC memo, I believe in 2009, uh, to the FBI concerning the scope of, of the National Security Letter Statute. Am I right that if we agreed with you about this proposition about the Stored Communications Act, that unless you're also right about the meaning of relevance, that this could be something of a pyrrhic victory for you, or at least only a transient victory for you? In other words, uh, your whole, one of your arguments about the relevance issue is that uh, if we interpret relevance as broadly in Section 215 as the government wants to do, then the government could get the same kind of records uh, out of um, just FBI administrative subpoenas, for example. And that kind of request is covered as an exception of the Stored Communications Act. Not exactly. Not exactly. In part because the Stored Communications Act limits the type of call records the government can acquire. So, for example, the government could not acquire, uh, it could only acquire uh, the originating phone number, the receiving phone number, and information about the duration of the call under the Sword Communications Act, including under the administrative subpoenas you're referring to. But they couldn't acquire things like the, uh, the identifying device number of the, of the device making the phone call. They couldn't acquire the trunk identifier, uh, which is something they acquire under the Verizon order here. But you're correct that they still would have the very broad interpretation of relevance available to them, and I think that's a defect in their argument. On the government's theory, uh, it could use any run-of-the-mill administrative subpoena statute, including the National Security Letter Statute, to acquire all of these very same records in bulk. Uh, and notable is the fact that none of those other uh, statutes include the sorts of protections that the government relies on in Section 215. In other words, they could rely on the National Security Letter Statute to acquire these very same records in bulk without the minimization procedures they point to as saving their collection from invalidation, uh, without the same sorts of limitations uh, that the, the FISC has imposed. Maybe they're going to get up and concede that that would be unconstitutional because it's only those minimization type procedures and the court order procedures and so on of Section 215 uh, that, uh, in their view, defeat your constitutional argument. It'll be interesting to see what they say about that. I would find that a little surprising because I think, I think their argument is, is a bit broader, that Smith controls this case. Yes, um, and that argument too. I, so, so maybe, uh, <laughs> uh, there's one other argument that I'll, I'll quickly you know, mention under our statutory argument, which is the, the real, the grid of our, our statutory claim before uh, proceeding to the Constitution. Uh, and that argument is that 
uh, the core problem with the government's theory on the merits of Section 215 is that it labels everything relevant uh, on the premise that uh, some tiny portion of everything. I, I, understand. I don't mean to interrupt your statement of that. I think we know what that argument is. You, if every, reminds me of Justice Stewart who said in, uh, that if everything is classified, nothing is classified. I mean, if everything is relevant, then relevance simply drops out. It's as though it doesn't exist. That's right. Uh, but a more technical question, I guess, is, is this is the, well, the statute says uh, that the government can apply for an order requiring the production of any tangible things, et cetera, right? The uh, question of uh, relevance doesn't come there in terms of the authorization. It comes later when it requires that the application to the FISA court include a statement of fact showing there are reasonable, excuse me, reasonable grounds to believe that the tangible things sought are relevant to an authorized investigation. I've got that right so far. And I'm wondering, I mean, it would be much easier for me if the authorization said for an order requiring the production of relevant tangible things rather than putting it down later in the, in, the, in, in, in the papers to the FISA court. And the reason I find this troubling or confusing, difficult, is it is, after all, the Administrative Procedure Act. And presumably the Administrative Procedure Act, the the, what we're talking about is the FBI and the NSA. And I'm wondering whether by putting this down, the question of relevance, down uh, uh, in terms of what must be shown to the FISA court, we're not being asked not to uh, review what the FBI uh, uh, and the um, uh, NSA did, but that we're being asked to, re to review what the FISA court did, the FISA court being an artist, it's certainly not an, an agency under the APA. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if the question makes sense, but I wonder whether but when you bring in relevance, and I understand the notion that everything that's relevant is very troublesome, uh, at least, but are we, are we are, if we say that that's wrong, that everything is relevant is wrong and the FISA court was wrong, by, by saying that everything was irrelevant was fine, are we then reviewing what an administrative agency has done or are we reviewing what the FISA court has done? And if the latter, do we have the power under, certainly under the APA to forget constitutional, do we have the power to, to review what the FISA court has done rather than what the agency sure, has I, done? I think the, the quick answer, and I'll elaborate, is that we're asking for the former uh, not the latter, but even if the latter, I think this suit would be appropriate. And, and I'll elaborate. But before Please. elaborating, I'll note that there are any number of uh, surveillance statutes that are structured in that way, that provide a grant of authority at the outset, uh, set out the limitations below. I don't think that's a novelty in Section 215. Mm -hmm. It's the same, for example, uh, in Section 1881A under FI the FISA Amendments Act. It sets out a general grant of authority at the outset, and, and, I, and I know Your Honor uh, and Judge Lynch are intimately familiar with uh, Section 702. Um, <laughs> but but to, to get to your... We were once, yes. <laughs> But to, to get to the your... We weren't as familiar with it as the Supreme Court thought we should have been. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to get to your, your precise question, we are challenging uh, agency conduct. We are challenging the government's daily collection of our records. We are not asking this court to, uh, to overturn the FISC. We are not asking this court to set aside uh, the Verizon order. We're asking for an injunction against continued collection uh, by the government. That could be put in place uh, without uh, saying anything to the FISC at all, uh, only with an instruction to the government. I think that's what our challenge is, and for that reason, it's properly understood as a challenge uh, under the APA. Uh, even if that were not true, even if, if you characterize our challenge as one to a fisc order, I don't think that would change matters. The government itself in the Supreme Court, in opposing an original petition filed there, 
that was actually challenging the Verizon order, uh, said that the appropriate avenue for relief was a district court case uh, such as the one we were litigating uh, and, and are now on appeal on, that that was the appropriate avenue. And the government itself noted that it's true that a district court action may not achieve precisely the same relief as was being sought in that case, namely vacature of the Fisk order. Uh, but, uh, but the plaintiffs would be entitled to receive uh, an adequate remedy, namely an injunction against ongoing and illegal uh, agency conduct. What happens, now that you mentioned that, what happens if the, um, there are now two district courts, at least two district courts, which have come to opposite conclusions within a week and a half of each other on the issues before us, and they did it on the, on the, uh, uh, on the um, uh, constitutional basis. What, where does it, supposing we were to affirm and the district court, uh, the DC circuit were to affirm. So you have one circuit that says it's unconstitutional, here's an injunction, and then the other one says, oh no, it's perfectly constitutional and we're certainly not going to give you an injunction because it's constitutional. Where does that leave uh, the, I mean, are they allowed to get records in, the D in D.C. and not in New York? I mean, where would that leave us if we had I imagine the government would simply seek a stay from the D.C. Circuit, and if they were not successful in seeking that stay, uh, they would ask the Supreme Court yeah. to resolve the conflict. Which so is, it would have to be the Supreme Court that would deal with it in that case? I, th I think so, and I think the Supreme Court likely would, uh, you know, permit a stay pending its resolution of that conflict. So if I may, I'll turn to, the, to our constitutional should, claims. Should we uh, 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 permit a stay subject to resolution of that? I mean, suppose we agree completely with you. Might we not, in order to avoid this sort of circumstances, and I guess you're going to get to this later, but might we not say, great, we agree with you, but there's other litigation going on. We want the Supreme Court to have a kick at the ball, uh, and we're very much concerned. Supposing we're wrong, and and somebody blows up a subway train. I mean, does it make sense for us to say, okay, here are our views, and then wait until uh, the, the uh, D.C. Circuit speaks and until the Supreme Court has an opportunity to speak before actually uh, um, uh, making an order of, of, you know, an injunction? I think it would be well within the court's authority. You know, we haven't yet taken a position on that, and we would yeah. be happy to if and when that, you know, right. that arises. That would be within our, our power to do if we thought that was wise. Yes. Thank you. So if I may, I'll proceed to the, to the Constitution. So uh, our claim under the Fourth Amendment, I think, is quite straightforward. It is, it is that the government's bulk collection of our call records intrudes upon a reasonable expectation of privacy. The government's primary defense, of course, is that uh, this case was decided in 1979 when the Supreme Court issued Smith versus Maryland. Uh, that's simply not the case. Well, let's, let's suppose that we uh, agreed or at least entertained the argument that uh, quantity is quality here and that the nature of this program is different than what was at issue in Smith. Uh, isn't there still quite a bit to the government's argument that even in this context, uh, there's not really much of an expectation of privacy in these records. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at uh, the opening of your brief, you have this nice parade of horribles about all the things the government could find out from these records. People could, the, the government could, if it chose, if someone looked into it, uh, from this metadata could determine, it, for example, it's likely that someone uh, was HIV positive, or it's likely that someone had, uh, had an abortion. Uh, uh, couldn't Verizon find out those things if it chose? And couldn't Verizon uh, uh, go into the records that it has and make the same kind of search and determine the same kind of private information and use it for purely commercial purposes, not remotely as important to anyone as the reasons the government uh, it seeks this data, to use this data to do. Uh, but just because they might be able to make money by selling uh, a, a list of people that Verizon thinks uh, have uh, recently um, uh, developed an unwanted pregnancy and they could sell that list to abortions are us uh, or to uh, an, uh, an anti-abortion group to uh, send uh, information to those, those people. Verizon could do that, couldn't they? 
I, I don't know that they could as a matter of our contractual relationship with Verizon. I don't think our contract provides for uh, unregulated access to our call records. Uh, in fact, you know, th as a matter of fact, the only access that Verizon typically has to our records is likely through its uh, computer, computerized collection of those records. And so it's a bit ironic that the government claims that uh, the computerized collection of those records extinguishes an expectation of privacy, but its computerized collection of those records uh, does Are not... Are you just hypothesizing something about your contract, or Absolutely. do you know something about your contract with Verizon that I don't know about mine? Uh, uh, that <laughs> Uh, that there's something in there that says they can't use uh, the uh, call records for anything but billing? I, I don't know the precise contours of what they can and can't do with the records. There, there are statutes that regulate uh, what telecommunications companies can do with their customers' records. They regulate what's well, called... Including the Stored Communications Act. So I take it they couldn't just say to uh, abortion providers or pro-life organizations, here's all our phone records, you go do search them and see if you can find people who might be uh, interested in your services. Uh, but, well, anyway, I mean, the, the point is Verizon has all of this information and presumably has uh, the computer capacity to uh, probe them uh, if it chose. They certainly they may, may very well have the computer capacity. I don't know whether they have the authority. I think it turns on the question of what uh, the congressional statutes regulating, yeah. uh, I forget the, the, the long form of the name, but CPNI, Customer Proprietary Network Information. Mm -hmm. There are regulations that protect that information, which include our call records uh, against the sort of unregulated access. I think uh, you're hypothesizing, Judge Lynch. I don't know the exact contours, though. You're correct. Uh, but I don't think anything turns on that question. Uh, the third, you know, I think this is another way of stating the third party records doctrine yeah. question. And I don't think that doctrine has ever been an on-off switch in the way that you're suggesting. Uh, there are frequently contexts in which information is shared with a third party, and yet uh, the uh, person whose privacy is reflected in that information nonetheless is recognized to have an expectation of privacy. Uh, that's undoubtedly. Well, could you illustrate some? Sure. Uh, all of our, uh, the contents of our phone calls are routed through Verizon communications. Uh, the contents of our calls are nonetheless strongly protected by the Fourth Amendment. They're also protected by federal statute. No one has ever suggested that Verizon's ability uh, to uh, listen to the content of our communications extinguishes our expectation of privacy. The same is true of our email. Our email is routinely stored on the parties, on the, on the servers of third parties. Uh, and, I, and I think courts are just now beginning to grapple with that question. Uh, and the Sixth Circuit, in a case called Warshak, held that despite uh, the possibility that Google might read your email uh, because the information is stored on that uh, third-party server, uh, customers nonetheless have an expectation of privacy. But the, the law knows there are enough, there are many ironies in this case. Uh, one of them, and it, maybe it, makes no legal or constitutional difference, but it's a little strange that once Mr. Snowden, through The Guardian and others, disclosed the existence of this program, we no longer had a reasonable expectation of privacy. We've just been told we don't have any privacy, that the government has it. And uh, I would like you, you, I suspect you can respond to that because you probably thought about it a lot longer than I thought about the question, but I wish you would focus in, as we do this, and, and even forgetting Smith versus Maryland and disclosure, talk to me about reasonableness. How do, it's a, in this case for originalists, the word reasonable is actually in the Fourth Amendment, right? Talk to me about how we figure out, the three of us figure out what's reasonable and what isn't reasonable. Sure. And if you, if I may, I'll, I'll just briefly address your first question, yeah. um, uh, which is now escaping me. And the first question is, now that everybody oh, knows everyone, about the, the, it and they're watching it on the Supreme, television. Sure. Yeah. The Supreme Court has recognized that there's an element of circularity to the CATS test, uh, and that expectations of privacy can be defined uh, if Congress so chooses through uh, a statute that permits bulk collection. But it is guarded against that possibility by, uh, I, analyzing a normative question along with uh, the CATS test, which is whether people uh, are objectively reasonable in expecting privacy. And I think you see that normative question being addressed by cases like Jones uh, and by cases like Riley, uh, both of which recognize that 
even though there's the capacity for greater intrusion into our personal privacy by companies uh, and by the government giving the digitization of information, uh, that doesn't fundamentally alter the relationship between uh, the citizens uh, of this country uh, and their government. Is, is the statutory issue at all relevant to the constitutional issue? Uh, in other words, uh, suppose this case came to us purely as a constitutional question after Congress had engaged in a full-scale debate as to whether to authorize explicitly exactly this program, and they did explicitly uh, authorize this program, and I suppose one could further hypothesize they did it uh, a few months before an election, and after an election in which this was an issue, the same congressmen who voted for this were, were returned to office. Would that make any difference to our estimation of what is a reasonable expectation of privacy? I think it would likely be relevant to the inquiry, but I, it, it cannot be dispositive. And the Supreme Court has noted, again, that the circularity of the CATS test uh, is, is not to be turned into a one-way ratchet for government intrusions into yeah, privacy. Yeah. I am wondering, though, also whether that means that even if there were some bar to our considering purely as a statutory question whether this program was authorized, whether if we found that this was an executive branch frolic and detour that was not authorized by any explicit legislation of Congress and was in fact prohibited by some provision of Congress, that as part of addressing whether this was constitutional or not, that such an unauthorized executive branch excursion would stand on different and shakier constitutional ground and might even be an unreasonable uh, intrusion on privacy without necessarily concluding that it would be unreasonable for the same program to operate if it had full, clear congressional authorization. I suppose that's right, although I don't think anything in our argument turns our I constitutional that's not argument. Your, argument. You right. want it, your, your <laughs> constitutional argument leads to the conclusion that even if Congress uh, authorized the program explicitly, it is still unconstitutional. I, I realize that's your position. That's right. Okay. But I, I, I see your suggestion. I think that could be an element of the reasonableness uh, of, of the expectation of privacy, uh, the fact that. Uh, the executive intrusion has not been authorized by Congress, has not been one deliberated over as by democracy. As opposed to what might happen if there was a real debate in the democratic uh, branches of government that led to uh, a decision to re-up this, this program. That's right. But I think, if anything, the current debate that's ongoing suggests the opposite. It suggests that Congress is not comfortable uh, and the country is not comfortable with bulk collection. Uh, and indeed, the president himself has now recognized that uh, bulk collection uh, creates an intolerable risk of abuse uh, and should be ended. And so I, I think that's maybe a good segue to get back to your question, Judge Sack, as to how to analyze reasonableness. Yeah. And I, I think uh, it's always about balancing the intrusiveness of the government search against uh, its rationale for doing so. But I'll say at the outset that I don't think the court even needs to get to uh, conducting that balance. Uh, the fact uh, that the government's uh, search proceeds without individualized suspicion, without satisfying the requirements of the warrant and probable cause uh, uh, clauses of the Constitution, is sufficient for us to prevail on the Fourth Amendment. But, but if, there, if, they, if Smith had any continuing uh, merit, I guess my first question is, you know, Smith allowed for the numbers dialed. Um, they said that that was not covered. And, People didn't have an expectation of privacy in that. Let's assume, um, uh, with regard to the, the program, that um, is it is it your contention that it would be it's unconstitutional for them to collect just that information in bulk? Just the information that was at issue in Smith. That's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, that it's unconstitutional. It would be. Okay. Uh, Smith dealt with. Uh, you know, primitive technology directed at an individual who was suspected of a crime over the course of three days. No, but the, the technology I don't think is an issue because, well, maybe to the extent of, of bulk, but with regard to what is actually being captured, which is the numbers dialed, are you saying that um, because the government is collecting that in bulk, in other words, 
for seven years or whatever of your client, that that is unconstitutional. That's right. I, I think if in 1979 the state of Maryland uh, had uh, investigated Michael Lee Smith not through the targeted use of a pen register, uh, but because it had, from the moment of his birth, created a database of every phone call he ever made or received uh, and kept that database in a government coffer, I think the Supreme Court would have understood that, that case to stand for a very different proposition, uh, and I wager they would have found that collection unconstitutional. Uh, so if that were the program uh, that we were challenging, I, st I still think it would be unconstitutional, uh, although uh, you know, I'll note that's not, you know, it's, it's more intrusive here on a number, you know, for a number of different reasons. How do we, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. How do we go about, we've been looking at this stuff and worrying about this, how do we go about knowing without any fact finding at all, in, I, Right, I keep looking and wondering whether we're having in-camera proceedings here. But uh, I'm wondering whether, whether, how without any fact-finding at all, can we begin to know, figure out, by a district court, by some trial court, presumably in-camera, uh, how can we begin to know whether this is reasonable or not? I mean, how can I begin to know whether you know, we're, we're, we're really because of the way the world is today, which is different from the way it was a week ago and different from the way it was uh, a year ago when this started in June of 13. How can we, without fact-finding, come up with some reasonable, uh, reasonable determination of reasonable? I don't think fact-finding is necessary. The parties have briefed the issue, and, the, the, and even the president now concedes uh, that the government can accomplish the interest it is seeking to serve through this program without bulk collection. That well, if the president thought that, why did he send his lawyers here to say that you should lose? I, I think he's awaiting a, legi a legislative solution. Uh, the, the president in the interim, I, has, I suppose, decided for the moment, to defend he, the program. For the moment, evidently, the president thinks that uh, it is necessary to continue operating this, this program and that it's, it's constitutional way. to do so. He might prefer some other way of doing it, but the representatives of uh, the government are here to say that they think this is presumably essential, but at least that it's a reasonable thing for the government That's right. to be doing. Our view is not that the president has conceded the unconstitutionality of the statute uh, but that the gov of the program, but that the government has conceded that there are alternative, uh, significantly less intrusive means but, for the government but, to accomplish. But, but nonetheless, uh, uh, yeah. fair enough. And one would hope that that does surely sound like the rational way to proceed. Uh, and we st started out with that, with that question. But Supposing, you know, because of legislative blocks, as, as, as Judge Lynch uh, spelled them out, you know, the possibilities that politically it won't fly after the election, and we're stuck with what we've got. That is to say, the whole country is stuck with either we say this is unreasonable and, uh, or it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment, or we conclude it's uh, uh, reasonable under the circumstances, given, given both the nature of the threat and what has to be done to control that threat. I mean, how do we do that based on briefs? There's, there's so if I could, I'll make a few points. Please. The, the first point is to make the one that I tried to make earlier, which is that I don't actually think the court even needs to get to the reasonableness balance. Uh, the government is only entitled to a question of free-floating uh, free floating reasonableness if it can demonstrate that the warrant and probable cause requirements of the Fourth Amendment are impracticable. And it cannot for the simple reason uh, that there is record evidence, uh, there is now a national consensus that the individualized, that the government can accomplish its interests through individualized applications. In but other that words- wouldn't, That wouldn't ordinarily require either probable cause or a warrant. In other words, this alternative procedure that we're envisioning, that you're envisioning, uh, that the president apparently is envisioning is one where Verizon keeps these records. And I take it, an ordinary grand, if you had a reasonable suspicion or even an unreasonable suspicion, but some reason the government wants to look at one person's phone records, they do that all the time by issuing a grand jury subpoena uh, or perhaps some national security letter or something of the sort without probable cause and without a warrant. But, and, but, and, the, and the argument is that's not a Fourth Amendment 
either it's not a Fourth Amendment event because of Smith against Maryland, or if it is, it's a reasonable one. That's right, but the government here is trying to engage in bulk collection. Right. And, if, and if, it's, if, it's, if we're correct that that implicates the Fourth Amendment, then the question becomes, uh, for purposes of the special needs doctrine, which the government has invoked, the first question becomes whether the government could accomplish its interests through targeted demands. If it could, uh, then it is not entitled uh, to forego the requirements of the Constitution. Now, we don't think it could use t uh, targeted demands to engage in bulk collection, but right. even the government has conceded that it could use targeted demands to accomplish its interests here. Uh, it uses a seed phone number to query its database. Instead of querying a database, it could use it to query. Right, but I'm, I'm just questioning, isn't what you're just saying the so-called free-floating reasonableness inquiry? It's an inquiry into whether what they're doing now in terms of bulk uh, uh, collection is, in light of possible alternatives, perhaps, a reasonable thing to do or an unreasonable thing to do. I don't know why the warrant requirement or the probable cause requirement comes into play uh, in, in that inquiry. I suppose it's because, at least in this case, the question of practicability seems to collapse with the question of reasonableness. But I think they are distinct inquiries. Under the Special Needs Doctrine, the first question is whether uh, dispensing with the requirement of individualized suspicion uh, is practicable or not. Here we don't think it is. Even if it uh, were impracticable for the government to acquire uh, these records in an individualized fashion, we would still think that the program is unreasonable for the very simple reason that it is the most intrusive means uh, that the government could use to accomplish its very narrow interests. Uh, that sort of program has always been held to be unreasonable. Uh, and that's in part, and I think this is a critical point, and I'll emphasize it again, it's in part because even the president has conceded uh, that the government's interests can be accomplished in narrow means. And it's not just the president. It's the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, that wrote a very lengthy report concluding that bulk collection is unnecessary. Uh, it's a hand-selected review group, uh, a group hand-selected by the president himself. Uh, that came to the same conclusion. And there's record evidence in this case uh, from Professor Felton, who's a professor of computer science at Princeton, explaining very simply how the government could uh, recreate this program in a targeted way that would not require uh, bulk collection. I, I, think, I think that showing goes to both the question of practicability and reasonableness. If Your Honor disagrees, then I'll, you know, I, I will defend our ground on reasonableness, but I still think it goes to the question of of okay. practicability. I, I, think, I think we, uh, unless my colleagues have further questions, I think once you get to the point of saying it's time to re-emphasize the point that you already made, uh, we've probably uh, uh, gotten to, uh, uh, to the end. So I thank you, thank you for your argument. You do have some time for rebuttal, which will probably be more than two minutes at the rate we're going. Uh, and Mr. Delery. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Stuart Delery for the government. Um, this case concerns an intelligence program that has been considered and approved by all three branches of government. It involves production to the National Security Agency of bulk telephony metadata, or call detail records, pursuant to orders of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court under a provision of FISA that has been twice reauthorized without change after Congress was briefed about this very program. So I think that you're starting off by saying it's been approved by all three branches of government, but you actually don't want us to address whether it was authorized by one of them. Um, if you're referring to the statutory preclu preclusion yeah. argument, um, yes, that's right. And we think that that was a choice that Congress made um, in specifying a very detailed provision for applications and approval of those applications uh, by, the, by the FISC, um, and then with a detailed review scheme following that, allowing for challenge by providers and ultimately review to the FISC review court and ultimately to the Supreme Court if appropriate. But the Supreme Court has been clear in Block and other cases that where Congress has established uh, clearly a specified form or forum or uh, limited parties for judicial review, um, then that provision, that, that process is exhaustive. But and Mark went on to, to address some very specific facts about the um, uh, judicial review program there that suggested that it was reasonable to assume that uh, uh, Congress had intended to preclude review by other parties. Uh, I don't know whether I'd go so far as to call it a test, but they set out a variety of factors and looked at those factors and concluded specifically with respect to that program that preclusion was a reasonable inference. 
Uh, I'm not sure that those factors come out the same way here. Uh, and I mean, you, you really hang your hat very heavily on uh, a generalization from Block, aren't you? That any time that Congress authorizes judicial review by one person, it must have intended to preclude judicial review at the behest of any other person? Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, I don't think we're relying just on a generalization. And obviously, the court has made clear that the inquiry is, uh, needs to be based on the structure of the statutory scheme at issue. Here, if you look at that structure, uh, first, as was alluded to uh, in the first part of the argument, um, there is no provision for challenge by third parties to these orders uh, because, as a matter of course, the expectation was that uh, at the time, the uh, third parties, including uh, people other than recipients of the orders, would not know about them. And that was but quite is, is clearly- that, me, Is that enough to assume that Congress intended to forbid review by such a third party if the third party did find out? In other words, I, I understand the idea that if we're asking, did Congress contemplate this kind of lawsuit? Did they implicitly authorize this kind of lawsuit? It's a pretty good argument to say, of course not. They didn't even imagine this sort of thing would ever happen because it could never happen if secrecy were maintained. But if there is a presumption that judicial review is available, and the question is, did Congress specifically intend to prohibit judicial review to these particular people? And the answer is, well, they probably never thought about it because they didn't think these people would be around. Don't you lose? Um, so I, I give a couple answers to that, Your Honor. First is um, uh, limiting the category of people who could challenge the orders was a deliberate choice made in, uh, reflected in the legislative history, as, as we have pointed amendment out. That you're talking about? Um, uh, and, and I think other discussions, uh, but certainly the amendment that uh, rejected proposed district court challenges uh, uh, to 215 orders. I think the key a provision that was not addressed in the first part of the argument is uh, uh, section 1861 F2D, part of 215, which says that an order issued pursuant to the procedure uh, by the FISC shall remain in full effect, that's a quote, uh, unless it has been explicitly modified or set aside pursuant to the procedures that are specified in the section. So I think that that's a, a clear textual statement by Congress um, that when the FISC orders are issued, they should be set aside only pursuant to the process uh, that uh, the court uh, or that Congress has specified there. And uh, preclusion here uh, makes perfect sense given the structure of the, uh, of the section, which provided for applications by the government to an Article III court established for the purpose of reviewing foreign intelligence op, uh, applications why and did, why requiring... Why would a recipient ever... I, I guess one did, so maybe we should have asked them, but I guess it's secret who they were, uh, so we can't ask them, so I'll ask you. Why would a recipient ever challenge one of these orders? They're given absolute immunity from any claims right. by their customers that they violated any rights by turning the stuff over to the government uh, in response to one of these requests. Uh, what, what, what stake do they have in saying anything other than, uh, here, government, take what you want? It's no skin off our nose, it's skin off their nose. Well, I, I think you're right, Your Honor, that, uh, that um we may not be the right people to ask, but I think uh, one could imagine business reasons or practical reasons uh, for making that decision. And as you indicate, um, uh, and as reflected in Judge Collier's opinion from the FISC, there has been such a challenge to an order uh, recently, and that led to a reaffirmation by the FISC of its, uh, of its production order on both statutory and constitutional grounds. Um, but so I think, um, given that we, ha we have here not just a situation where Congress has said that uh, certain challenges to agency action should be brought only in a particular forum, uh, but have, have required judicial approval before uh, the private party is required to make the production to the government. Uh, preclusion of the type that we're talking about here makes complete sense, and the plaintiff's argument really requires a collateral challenge to an order by another uh, well, Article that's, III that's court. A, that's a very, uh, that is an interesting and troubling point, but on the other hand, Mr. Abdo points out that exactly such a challenge is apparently authorized, the government concedes it's authorized on constitutional grounds. So the government's position appears to be that we can collaterally review, if that's the way you want to look at it, the FISC order to test its consistency with the Constitution, but not to test whether it's consistent with Section 215. 
Right. I think, uh, Your Honor, that is the consequence of the Supreme Court's uh, implied preclusion doctrine and block in related cases as compared to uh, what the court has said, for example, in Webster versus Doe about what is required uh, for a court to view Congress having intended to preclude constitutional claims. It's a, it's a higher standard as a matter of uh, it, to avoid serious constitutional questions. Is there, any, is there right. any role for the doctrine of constitutional avoidance here? I mean, you're asking us, you're, you're requiring us to decide a question of constitutional law, uh, to decide whether perhaps the um, uh, government is precluded from doing this sort of thing, even if Congress wants it done, or on the other hand, to accept an argument that says nobody's got any constitutional privacy rights in anything, really, anymore. Because surely the same argument, may I should ask you this first, uh, the, the same third party argument that you're making as a matter of constitutional law and the same relevance argument that you're making under the statute apply to bank records and credit card records, don't they? Uh, it, uh, obviously, to some extent, there are elements of the same argument, but well, the let's argument... Well, let's take it through. They're third party records, right? So Smith against Maryland applies. Um, Smith against Maryland itself uh, was limited to non-content records, and actually the court made a point of distinguishing uh, the situation of content collection. Obviously, there are other cases, including United States Miller versus Miller, involving uh, financial records that dealt with other types of uh, other types of information. I think that the key under both the Fourth Amendment uh, and under the uh, relevance test under the under the statute. Um, uh, in, in both lines of cases, the court has made clear is a totality of the circumstances type inquiry. What is relevant under the circumstances? Uh, well, I mean, what, it, what is, is reasonable it, under look, the circumstances? It, come on, isn't it at least as relevant to you whether somebody that you have some reasonable suspicion is engaged in terrorist connections used his credit card last week to buy a ton of fertilizer as it is to find out whether he called his gym? Uh, on uh, using his Verizon cell phone, right. so I, I think, or you're even to find out, you know, who who his other colleagues are. Uh, there is an, a clearly relevance in the sense that you're talking about it. In fact, if you had that guy and you wanted to get his his precise credit card records, is there any question you'd you'd serve a grand jury subpoena to get that? So I don't understand why the same jump that says you can collect all the stuff in advance, essentially to make it easier, quicker, and I'm not, I'm not denigrating that interest, to make it easier and quicker to make the inquiry and find out what all the connections are and what this guy is up to. Why doesn't the same thing apply to credit card records? Um, I, I think certainly Your Honor is correct that um, the the seeking the types of information that you're talking about, asking those questions in counterterrorism and other types of investigations occur by law enforcement every day. Um, and um, those are important elements of the uh, a set of tools that the government has uh, to pursue counterterrorism uh, investigations. What we're talking about here, the, the proposition of relevance that has been advanced here and that the FISC has approved um, is, is, however, tied to the nature of the records that are being collected in bulk, bulk telephony metadata or call detail records, putting the Smith question aside about the, the fact that those are actually, what, what we're talking about is information that is provided by telecommunications companies from their own records that they have created and maintained for their own business purposes. But if you just look at, at, at what the government's use of the, uh, uh, of the metadata is, um, the record in this case, including the declarations that were submitted uh, in connection with the preliminary injunction and the orders of the FISC make clear um, that the purpose of the bulk collection is to allow for um, the use of analytic tools in counterterrorism investigation. So it's both the, the nature of the data, which is interconnected and can be standardized and, and therefore can be searched through what's called contact chaining to uh, make connections, and, and uh, in, in furtherance of a particular type of investigation, um, which are uh, not ordinary criminal investigations looking back at uh, who perpetrated a crime that we know about, but are designed to be forward-looking. Uh, the, the purpose of this work is to detect and disrupt future plots um, before an attack can be made. But and so the... 
I'm Judge sorry, Lynch's Your Honor. Point, why is it, well, bank records seem to me to basically have the same sort of information, and under Miller, it appears that you know that that, that um, depositors don't have an, an interest in in sort of their bank records either. Obviously, with, there may be certain limitations on that, but but right. isn't it isn't it a similar sort of thing? And couldn't couldn't then the government aggregate everybody's bank records and apply the same you know query uh, sort of methodology to get at the same sort of linkages? Um, so, so that is a, a question um, that would be relevant to, to use a term, uh, to, to the question of what, whether that, uh, that type of collection is authorized. Here, um, I think it's important that the FISC has examined uh, the, the type of data uh, and have, has established that it can be uh, collected into a database and queried in an interconnected way uh, in, in the way that the NSA does it. Um, other types of data, even if very valuable for law enforcement and used routinely, um, uh, may not have the same uh, uh, benefits from aggregation ex ante uh, and, and querying based on uh, standardized formats. And so the answer here uh, would not necessarily uh, be the same. It's a question. Well, I I'm think sorry. that. I, I'm having a little trouble understanding this. Is, is the idea that telephone records are uniquely uh, kept in similar formats by all providers so that unlike bank records, uh, they're more susceptible to collection in this database? I, I sort of thought the point was almost the opposite, that if you had to wait and, you know, we have this guy's phone number. We think he's right. engaged in something suspicious. We'd like to know who he talks to and who the people that he talks to talk to. Uh, now, I take it you can serve a subpoena on his phone provider and get all the people he talks to, and then you can serve subpoenas on the phone providers of all of those people uh, and get that information. So all that information is gettable. I would have thought, and maybe I'm completely mistaken, that the problem with doing that is it's awfully time consuming. You have to track down who everybody's provider is and so on, and so having it all on your server in your back room and doing whatever you need to do to translate the Verizon records and the Sprint records and the T-Mobile records so they're all compatible is the whole point of what makes this beneficial. Am I mistaken about that? Uh, no, you're correct about that. So and why isn't, isn't, isn't that obviously true about every bank? Uh, that if you got all the bank records, it would be the same sort of thing. You can go subpoena by subpoena uh, or you can collect right everything there is to know about everybody and have it all in one big government cloud with, and I understand this, with the procedural right. protections you've got internal to the government about what you're going to look at it for and when you're going to look at it. But I just don't understand an argument as to what's so special about telephone records that makes them so valuable, so uniquely interactive or whatever that the same arguments you're making don't apply to every record in the hands of a third party business entity of every American's everything. Okay. Um, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, come back to the point embedded in there about the minimization and other uh, restrictions yeah. on the use, which I do think is critical to understanding uh, the appropriateness of this program. But on the, on the question of relevance, um, uh, I think you are cor you're correct in, uh, in your general description as reflected in the declarations here about the purpose of the uh, collection of the data. Um, if the, uh, and that the advantage of doing it in advance uh, is that it allows for uh, uh, standardization where that is necessary, although I do think phone records by their nature tend to be uh, you know, and are quite standardized and to allow for rapid uh, identification of connections between known and unknown terrorists. I mean, that is really the, the purpose mm -hmm. of the program, as, as again, is reflected in the record and in the, in the district court opinion, uh, frankly. Um, the, the purpose is to be able to identify uh, from a, uh, a known person uh, with some connection to a, a permissibly targeted terrorist organization who that person is in contact with and in particular might be in contact with in the United States. Um, and the, uh, the analytical tools to make those connections and to, and to uh, 
uh, identify them rapidly are at the core of this particular program. Well, rapidly has to be what it's about, right? Because uh, it, it, some of us sitting here have done this in criminal investigations, right. uh, know exactly how important it is to get people's phone records to trace their connections, and it's done every day in the week with targeted subpoenas right. about the people that one is suspicious of. And having done it, I can tell you there are a lot of burdens in, in, get, in doing it right. case by case. Uh, uh, but, but surely you agree this could be done by targeted subpoenas. It's a question of, again, I don't mean to minimize it at all, the efficiency, convenience, uh, speed of making these, these inquiries. Yeah, so whether it's sufficiently timely, that is certainly an element. Uh, I think other other aspects that are again reflected in the record and in the FIS conclusion are uh, the need for uh, examination across carriers so that you're following the links uh, uh, where people are communicating using different carriers uh, and uh, the again to build a historical uh, repository for some period of time uh, because going in uh, the government doesn't know uh, who uh, which of the uh, metadata might reveal an important connection to a known terrorist. And so if, if you started only when you identified that person, yeah, that information would not be uh, as valuable. Well, it's a question so also, also of whether the phone company keeps all of these records, though I, I think Judge Sack was suggesting earlier and Mr. Abdo suggests in terms of what the president has suggested by legislation, that that problem could be solved by requiring the phone companies to keep this information indefinitely uh, against the, the possibility of future collection. I, mean, what, 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 I want to get back to this question of constitutional avoidance, uh, because you are asking us to decide something that is extraordinarily sweeping. Uh, without inquiring you know, as to whether this is something that ever could be allowed under the Constitution without addressing whether the Congress of the United States has ever really thought about this, uh, this program. Uh, uh, and putting aside the issue of preclusion, it's, it's a little hard for me to imagine that somebody who looked at a law that said, you can have an order that will get anything that you could get like with a grand jury subpoena, imagine that that means you could get stuff that nobody ever imagined getting with a grand jury subpoena before. Maybe it could be gotten, maybe it could have been done, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's a little hard to imagine that that rather innocuous language about get documents when they're relevant to, to make a showing of relevance to an investigation means that all kinds of records that, as I read your brief, you're really saying they're not relevant really to an investigation right now. We just want to have them in case they become relevant so that we can query at that point this database. Um, why, why would we think that Congress, you know, bought that uh, using this language in Section 215? Um, I think one reason, Your Honor, is because Congress uh, was briefed about this very program and uh, extended Section 215 twice without change. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the details of this are reflected in our brief. Yeah. I think that this, this does reflect ratification in a way that the I ordinary... Wonder, uh, I wonder, I wonder yeah. how valid the ratification argument is when you're dealing with secret, what is essentially secret law. I thought the ratification notion is that you're dealing with something that's public and therefore by ratifying it again and again you're in somehow reflecting the public will because they know about it. I'm not sure ratification carries as much a baggage as you want it to if you're talking until June of 2013 when, when people knew this was going on. Um, I think, Your Honor, the reason it does here is because um, uh, we're not just talking about a, a presumption that if, you know, if it's in the federal reporters somewhere, uh, Congress is deemed to know about it. Here, um, Congress, the, the, the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees were briefed uh, over time uh, about the details of the program. And then in advance of reauthorization in both 2010 and 2011, uh, the executive branch provided uh, a, a briefing paper to be made available to all members in, in 2010 uh, and uh, before the 2010 ratification, all senators uh, in 2011, that detailed not only the nature of the program, but that the FISC had authorized it, that the, uh, the relevance requirement in the statute had been met, uh, that it was consistent with the Supreme Court's 
precedent under uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment in reference to Smith versus Maryland. And in fact, the, uh, some of the statements that uh, in the plaintiff's brief that they highlight from some of the senators were made in connection with the 2011 reauthorization where they specifically called their colleagues' attention to the legal interpretation of Section 215 and the importance of understanding how it was being used uh, in connection with this very program. And so, uh, uh, you know, finally, the, the chairs of the intelligence committees made this material available and offered briefings more generally uh, to all members and, and also repeated the, uh, the, in, the need for members to understand how it was being used. So I think that this, is a, this goes beyond the ordinary you, ratification. It's getting late, later in the afternoon. I want to make sure I understand whether you're arguing about preclusion or about 215 and whether relevance is, a, uh, uh, is, is an appropriate, uh, I'm forgetting the Constitution for now. I'm, I'm arguing here um, that uh, Congress understood Section 215 to cover the program that okay. we're talking about and so the types you're, of records you're beyond, here. you're beyond preclusion. Right. I, I also think that by extending uh, Section 215, knowing, uh, uh, you know, knowing what's going on, I think it, uh, it, I suppose it more broadly, it more broadly in the well, way that Judge Lynch was talking about. Well, maybe it after Judge Pauly's decision and before we say anything to the contrary, if we were to, uh, that would be the kind of thing that would be a typical ratification argument, right? That they, the, the Congress would ratify Judge Pauly's uh, analysis of uh, the preclusion issue. But the preclusion issue is not otherwise something that's it was before Congress in some judicial opinion when they did one of these reauthorizations. Now, on the preclusion point, I think you're on. There, there you're relying on the original legislative yes. history at the beginning. Um, but for the, the relevance argument, you're relying on, in part, on the idea that Congress re-upped this statute, Section 215, uh, after the program had been instituted, the Fisk Court had approved it, and uh, there was this process of briefing in Congress, and I, I don't, I, I don't think there's anything classified. You can tell me if it is, and if you can't answer it. But uh, could you just explain to me if I'm a member of the Congress, an ordinary member, not a member of some special committee, what exactly was I told? I don't mean what was in the classified briefing. What was I told? about you better go read this before you vote for this. What, what memo did I get from whom? Uh, so uh, I think there were memos from the chairs of the two intelligence committees, and they are in the joint appendix, uh, so you can look at them. Uh, but they identified that in connection with the reauthorization, information had been provided by the, I'm paraphrasing, but mm -hmm. information had been provided by the executive branch uh, that was important for evaluation of the uh, reauthorization of this uh, of this authority in Section 215. And it was then up to me to go and figure out if I, it was worth it for me to go and read it as they were telling me I should and to do it or not. And I'm just a little, uh, right. you know, when I think of, uh, you know, things like legislative vetoes and other issues where the Supreme Court has emphasized that legislation gets done when each house votes for it and the president signs it, this notion that the legislation has been accomplished because uh, I, as a member of Congress, got a letter saying you should go read something that's in a secret compartment before you vote on this, that it's therefore assumed that Congress approved whatever was in that. That secret compartment. I think the further fact that we have here is that there were members, uh, including Senators Wyden and, and Udall, who were pointing to this very debate uh, again at the time. So it, it wasn't so some, just. Some people it, got up on the floor and said, yes. Listen, you bozos, you really better go read this because if you read it, you'll be scared and you won't want to vote for this and we don't want right. to vote for it because of what's in there. We can't tell you what it is in public, but you better go read it. And nevertheless, they, they voted. Right. And, and so in other contexts, the court has said, you know, the uh, Supreme Court has indicated that references and committee reports, for example, are sufficient. This, I think, goes beyond what you'd look at in an ordinary ratification, no, no, no. given I, the classified I, I think so, but Justice Scalia doesn't seem to, uh, as far as what, what counts as legislation. But I guess you may take it up with him someday. And, and to your point, <laughs> um, uh, Your Honor, about uh, the, the current state of discussions in Congress and, and the president's position, I mean, I think, um, 
Uh, it is certainly correct that the, uh, the wisdom of this program in light of its nature and scope is the current subject of a public debate and a debate within Congress. As was indicated, there are, uh, there are multiple proposals uh, that have been introduced and that process is working forward. The President uh, has... But we could... It, 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 this, I suppose, is not a consideration that's entirely appropriate for a court, but, but and if this court said we don't think this is authorized by Congress, that would kind of put it to them, wouldn't it? To actually act on whether they think that this is something that should be done or not. Uh, and then they could take their vote and that would put paid to all these issues as far as, uh, short of the Constitution, it would put paid to all the issues about whether this is legislatively authorized if Congress just voted and yeah, said... All I have to do is, is take out the word relevant. Yeah. All I, no, I have to do is say, we think this program is okay. Right. Keep doing this, or alternatively, don't do this anymore. And, and then there would be nothing... If, if they did the latter, we wouldn't have a constitutional issue either. If they did the former, then the constitutional issue, I suppose, would still be around. And the, the Section 215 authority uh, will sunset in June of next year, so some action has to be taken one way or the other, either to extend it or to change it in light of the current ongoing debates. What the President has said um, is that he supports uh, uh, achieving the goals, national security goals, reflected in the Section 215 authority without the government uh, uh, actually ingesting the bulk metadata, uh, allowing querying at the providers. Although in the same statement in March, he also noted that in order for that approach to be workable with the speed and in the manner uh, necessary to accomplish the goals, legislation would be required. And so he directed that in the meantime, because he thought it was important, or in his judgment it was important, uh, to continue this capability that the, uh, that the government go to the FISC and seek continued reauthorization 90, of the program. 90, 90 days they are now. Uh, uh, and it's now been uh, reauthorized a second time with the two restrict two changes with, yeah, that Your uh, Honor I, spoke I seem to about recall that September 10th is the uh, next re-up date. It's I believe September 12th is the, uh, the expiration of the, uh, the current order as reflected in the briefs. Um, but so, so um, I just think that clarifies some of the discussion earlier about where things currently stand. And um, the, uh, if I might turn uh, to, if there are no more questions about the statutory authorization, I think that the, um, I'll turn to the Fourth Amendment if, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, our position is um, that the FISC and the district court uh, in this case did correctly conclude that under Smith versus Maryland, uh, the acquisition of business records uh, reflecting bulk te telephony me, metadata was not me, a search. Let me tell you what problem I have with that. And it's not just, uh, you know, those were the old days. But does the question is, and maybe I don't think I'm using the mosaic approach, uh, but, uh, but doesn't there come a time, and isn't this what the, the, the plaintiffs are contending, doesn't there come a time when the old-fashioned simple pen register that was used in uh, Smith versus Maryland or, and that we are recognized and we've recognized it for a long time, where the amount of data that you have of that sort is so detailed and so uh, extensive that in fact it is a content divulging action rather than not. The whole point of the prime minister's instruction, say the whole point, I would suggest I read it again this morning, but, but the point was you're just, it's something that you already give out. Anyhow, it's given to a third party, so it's, uh, 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 it's, not, a, it's not a big, it, and it's not as though you are listening in, which would be different. And the question is, I think, or a question is whether the, 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 the methods have been so, become so sophisticated of analyzing this kind of data that this, unlike a, a pen register, in this case you are finding out content. Uh, is there any uh, uh, oomph to that idea? Um, I think so, certainly uh, uh, this is the, uh, one of the issues I think that's been uh, 
a factor in the public debate uh, over the last year since the disclosures. Um, I'd make a couple of points. First, here, um, again, we, we are in fact talking about the same type of information uh, that was at issue <coughs> in Smith. Uh, and so but, but, to the extent- to, 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 to that point, to the point to, to add to what Judge Sack was just saying, Judge Pauly didn't go um, each piece of metadata by metadata and do the analysis that was done in Smith. Right, he didn't. He did so. It was. It was sort of a. a um, he said that it's third party and it's like similar type information. But wouldn't doesn't the doesn't it require that actually he well or should it require that actually that determination is made based upon if you're talking about a right to privacy, you look at each part of the metadata and make a determination at that point. Why why shouldn't the court have it? have to go through that exercise. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the record in this case reflects that if, if you're talking about the type of information that's at issue, that we are talking about the same type of uh, call data record, call detail records that were at issue in Smith. So the number call uh, and number received, the uh, routing information, time and duration of the calls. We're not talking about name or address or financial information or cell site location. The question is whether the technology hasn't changed so much that the analysis that it's just a pen register doesn't work anymore. So uh, uh, the, the next two points that I would, I would make on that are one, um, the, the ability of metadata to reveal useful information to investigators and in particularly connections was known at the time of Smith and it was actually, uh, uh, the, in effect, the power of the metadata was a point that the dissenters in Smith itself uh, pointed out, obviously did not carry the day with the court, uh, which concluded that uh, uh, even though the expectation is that phone companies are assembling the metadata, if only because you know you get a list of all of your calls at the end of the month, um, uh, that was not a, uh, that did not give rise to a protected Fourth Amendment interest. And so, um, it, you know. Put way, even that very simple stuff that comes from the pen register is used in courtrooms in the United States every day in the week when assistant U.S. attorneys get up and say, Here's a chart of the, uh, all the times that uh, conspirator A talked to conspirator B on his cell phone uh, in the days leading up to the drug transaction. Uh, you, the jury, should infer from that what they're talking about. They're talking about the drug transaction. Or alternatively, uh, here's a record. Uh, we don't have the content of the phone call, but we have a record of the person, the insider at Goldman Sachs uh, talking to the trader uh, right before, here's the record of the trader's uh, purchase of uh, the, the stock in question right before the announcement of, of some new public information. What, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you think they were talking about? Uh, that's proof uh, that this was a leak from the insider. So the, there's no secret about the fact that metadata never was, never was in Smith, any secret about the fact that metadata can reveal content. And the point about the power of the technology now that allows analysis uh, leads me back to the point that I, I wanted to make in response to Judge Lynch a moment ago, which is um, it's important not to lose sight of all of the other protections uh, that are built around uh, the acquisition and retention and use of the data under this program, given its bulk uh, uh, you know, the, the bulk nature of the uh, production to the government and uh, in light of the technology. And um, I think that, that that's critical to understand that the, the you know, in addition to being only non-content information uh, about the telephone calls, the uh, data can only be queried uh, in, for counterterrorism purposes and then only uh, if there's a reasonable articulable suspicion that the selection term, uh, number or, uh, uh, or whatever, is uh, connected, uh, associated with a specified foreign terrorist but, but organization. None of those and safeguards are built into the legislation. The right. legislation, Your Honor. The legislation Honor, is totally silent as to any of that. Um, I don't think that's right, Your Honor. So um, in uh, 1861, subsection G, I believe it is, requires minimization procedures uh, to uh, be because I think the text of the statute reflects um, it was understood that this, this tool could be used to obtain uh, data that would uh, relate to um, 
you know, a, a number of U.S. persons. And so the statute requires that the FISC or that the, that the government propose uh, and, and that an element of the program be robust minimization procedures. They've been spelled out then in detail in the orders of the FISC, but the, that there would be protections around the use and dissemination of the data was reflected in the statute. But now that we've got some experience with um, uh, minimization procedures, it presumably would be possible to spell out something in legislation if this program were going to be authorized by Congress explicitly that um, said what made sense and what didn't make sense. I mean, after all, this just says the Attorney General has to specify. And so far, the record is basically Fisk signed off on what the Attorney General asked for. And when uh, it got made more restrictive, that was because uh, the Attorney General asked for it to be made more restrictive. Uh, and that's not a criticism of the Fisk Court because they're operating essentially in an ex parte context. Nobody's there saying, here's what would be better minimization procedures, or we think this is what the Constitution requires. The government goes in and says, here's a list of things we think you should tell us to do. And the court says, okay, you can, that, that's what you should, those restrictions are approved. Right? I mean, that, that, I, I, my concern about all of this is that if, you know, it, it's fine to say we've got this program and this is the, we never misuse this data, we only use it for these purposes and we have rules to, to have that happen. Uh, that's not the same thing as the government not having that information sitting there uh, where, uh, you know, I, mean, I don't know what Mr. Snowden could have done. Maybe instead of leaking the order, he could have leaked the database to somebody. Uh, uh, we don't know what happens when some inhabitant of the White House, this one or another one, has a plumber's unit. Uh, and decides to let them have access to the database. So these are realistic concerns uh, about letting the government have this, this massive uh, body of data without anything but even the, I mean, of course, look, anyone, I'm sure part of your answer has to be, and it makes sense, whoever makes the rules, they could be abused. If we told the government it can't do this, it has a technological capacity, and if we're imagining a government that breaks all the rules, uh, they could get it anyway somehow. They could tap all our phones and we'd never know it, and if they're bad guys, these are all paper restrictions. But there are levels of restriction, and you know, it's one thing to have Congress adopt a program and say, this is what it is, and we've considered what needs to be done to give protections, and one that says, well, they can get what's relevant, but they should be careful how they use it. And then we infer from that this massive, this massive program. Um, uh, so I think, Your Honor, I, I think the record on the enactment of Section 215 and its extensions uh, respectfully goes beyond the last version uh, yeah. that you just articulated. Um, but I do think that the, the point about in the national security area, uh, the, the political branches uh, being charged with, uh, within a range, drawing the lines about what steps are appropriate to accomplish national security needs, something that the Supreme Court um, has articulated in the Fourth Amendment context, for example, in the Keith decision, um, uh, urged the, uh, that uh, Congress draw some of these lines almost, be uh, I'm not sure that this is the phrase that was used, but because some of these questions are susceptible, uh, in effect, to legislative fact-finding uh, mm -hmm. about what is appropriate, uh, uh, what trade-offs are appropriate in the in, to meet the needs of national security. Um, similarly, in the McWaid and Cassidy cases, this court, uh, in evaluating. Uh, 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 types of uh, uh, anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism activities in connection with the subways and ferries uh, noted uh, that there, uh, again, that the court should be reluctant to rest away from the political branches uh, the choices about how these uh, judgments should be made and Hence where the balance should be we should be very cautious strong. about making a constitutional determination. Right. And, and which is why I think, um, Your Honor, uh, should uh, evaluate the program that we have. Uh, the, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously a, a desire to ask questions about um, uh, you know, what might arise in other contexts. But given that the Supreme Court has made clear that the reasonableness examination is a totality of the circumstances type question, and you do have Smith, and you do have the same type of information that was at Smith, uh, if you're reaching a constitutional 
uh, issues, we urge a, a focus on the program, well, we have which to reach, is we, lawful. You agree um, we have to reach the constitutional issues? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, I, 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 well, I was you, referring to your, your preclusion point, which, oh, yeah. uh, which respectfully, I think, um, is a function of, of the regime that Congress established. In, uh, and the Supreme Court has, has also recognized that where that is the case, where Congress has not provided an APA cause of action, the consequence may be the examination of a constitutional and not a statutory claim. That was the issue in Webster versus Doe, and that, that was the result, that the court reached the constitutional, or said that the constitutional claim could be reached, not the statutory claim, because there was not an APA cause of action it, available. It seems to me quite simple that, that the only way we can uh, uh, achieve constitutional avoidance in this case is by ruling against you on something statutory. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we're, we're forced to get there anyhow, right? Right. And, and again, our, our position is that Congress... And you prefer we not rule against you? On I prefer that you not rule against us. That's certainly true. But that here, um, Congress uh, has not provided jurisdiction for the court to reach the statutory claims. Uh, well, no, that there's not an APA that. waiver of sovereign immunity. And that. so therefore, we are left with the constitutional argument. There, we think, um, that whether you do it at the level of Smith versus Maryland, which we think remains binding precedent, and answers the question about the, uh, whether it, it's a Fourth Amendment search to get the records from the telephone companies in this context, or if you go to the uh, special needs inquiry and the reasonableness uh, approach, if you look at the program as a whole, um, not just the initial collection, but the fact that the FISC has authorized that collection only upon the imposition of robust uh, controls over the, uh, when the data may be queried, what may be done with the results of the queries, uh, you know, very elaborately set out in the primary orders, and with reporting back to the FISC. Um, you know, this is not uh, respectfully just the, f uh, and I think this is reflected in the court's opinions, which have now been uh, declassified, not just the court uh, accepting whatever the government offered, but uh, making determinations uh, according to its own statements that uh, with these procedures, it's, uh, the program strikes an appropriate balance with providing the capability uh, that is Is there in, any that is this order that imposes more restrictions than the government sought at the time? Um, I don't... I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, uh, my, my point was that if, if you look at uh, several of the recent uh, opinions, which I had a, occasion yeah, to yeah, read, I'm not they're, they're specifying. They're, yeah, I'm not, I've that, never suggested right. there being some kind of rubber stamp. I'm just right. saying the, the, the procedures there are a little different than the procedures that would be in place in a district court or, for that matter, in Congress in terms of having a robust consideration uh, not just from what the government says is a good idea to minimize right. and whatever the judge can bring to bear in his or her own experience, but to a real debate. Right. So what, um, what I think I, uh, what I can say is that um, although these particular orders are not in the joint appendix here, they, um, among the declassified uh, materials from the FISC are uh, opinions reflecting reactions to uh, compliance uh, issues that were identified and steps that the FIS took in response, um, which, uh, as I recall, included orders that were not simply things that were proposed by the government, but that is a, a general recollection on that front. I think you seem to rely in part, and properly so, on material that has in the last year and a half or so been declassified and therefore should serve to assure us that, uh, that there is not a, a special needs problem or a Fourth Amendment problem. It's odd. What else? That's what you've let us know. What else haven't you let us know? I mean, you were pushed to that for polit. I say this with all, more than all due respect, with all respect. I do, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but all of this stuff that we now know, and we don't know, we don't know. All of the stuff we now know is as part of a political reaction to the. The, the understanding that this program was in effect. Isn't that so? I mean, aren't you arguing a good deal from a material that was made, that was classified until uh, a June ago and was made uh, public as a reaction to that public? I mean, certainly that is true, that there's now information public uh, in, in the public realm that had not been public before. Um, 
but this program, and, and I think this is the critical aspect of the congressional design, um, was subject to Article III uh, review from the beginning uh, by operation of the FISC, which was a, a body that Congress set up specifically to accomplish that, uh, just as uh, the intelligence committees um, act uh, as the channel for oversight of the executive branch on, uh, from the congressional side where you're ne by necessity dealing with classified information. It would but certainly, uh, it certainly, this is entirely useless, I can't say this, but the whole system surely would be, uh, give one a much warmer feeling inside if it was not all ex parte, but there was some representative of the other side even if that some representative of the other side was a, uh, um, um, a, a, uh, a pro bono uh, um, uh, um, amicus, or not pro bono, Pam, get uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Fitzgerald out from Chicago and have him argue the other side of these. And I, I for one, would find what you say I'm not talking law now, that's why it's out of school, but I find this a lot more uh, uh, um, reassuring if it were subject to an adversary process, and it's not. And as your, as your Honor may be aware, among the proposals that are currently pending uh, for change to the program would uh, include provisions that allow for, and, the, and there are more than one option on the table, uh, the kind of approach that you're talking about. Well, but in, in fact, case, in that case, I vote for it. <laughs> but in fact, I think um, you know, if you look at the if, if you look at the reasonableness inquiry, for example, um, I think. Uh, you know, and, and, and balance the factors that uh, the Supreme Court and this court have said should be balanced. On the one hand, um, uh, there certainly is an overriding importance in uh, preventing uh, future terrorist attacks. Here, um, the uh, intrusion, if any, uh, you know, subject to the Smith argument, on uh, the privacy of individuals is, uh, is carefully cabined um, to, uh, to allow the examination of the data, to allow the identification of connections only on finding of uh, reasonable articulable suspicion and then the other uh, procedures that are in place. So the statutory and FISC imposed safeguards uh, limit the use, retention, and dissemination of the records that are collected. There's also an oversight uh, system by the FISC and by Congress, as well as other entities in the executive branch. All of this, um, I, I submit, or we submit, should lead the court, if evaluating the Fourth Amendment question, to conclude that the program as it currently stands is reasonable because the of Fourth Amendment- something can be constitutionally reasonable whether or not it gives us a warm feeling and we all understand that. that. That is certainly true, and because the test is whether it's a re uh, reasonably effective right. means of accomplishing the interest, there's no least restrictive means yeah, requirement here. I think we all here. understand that. Um, I, it looks like you're folding up. I was about right. to say, we've given about, unless my colleagues have more questions, we've given you about as much time as we gave uh, Mr. Abdo. I think we understand your argument, unless there's something you think you haven't gotten to that's critical. Uh, Anything uh, about the First Amendment that hasn't been mentioned? Well, then they didn't mention it either. So uh, I <laughs> think we, we'll, we'll consider that based on the, the briefs, because he's not going to be able to pick it up in rebuttal since uh, Mr. Delery hasn't talked about it, and Mr. Abdo didn't talk about it in his uh, initial uh, 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 argument any more than Mr. Delery spoke about the standing argument, which doesn't mean he's waived it. It means he's relying on his, uh, his brief. But, uh, I, I don't know that we need to hear more about any of those things. So unless, you, as I say, I, I don't want to cut you off if there's something critical that we should know that you haven't gotten to, uh, but we've, we've given it uh, uh, probably more time than you'll get in the Supreme Court, let alone right. uh, and there, usual arguments. I there. can also assure you, if and when you get to the Supreme Court, you won't see two of these there. <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ebdo, I will hear you, we will hear you on uh, rebuttal. Uh, I don't know that you're limited to two minutes in light of all that's been said. At the same time, we have had a very thorough discussion of the issues, I believe. Uh, so I hope that you will be able to be relatively brief and respond only to points that you haven't had an opportunity to address so far that Mr. Delery has spoken of. Uh, on his side of the argument. With that, go ahead. Of course, and just a few points, Your Honor. The first is to respond to Mr. Delery's discussion of ratification. 
That doctrine is not a game of gotcha with congressional intent. The question is always whether there is an official interpretation of statute that Congress was aware of and legislated uh, on the basis of, and that's simply not the case here. Uh, many members of Congress were not aware of the program. Those who were were not provided any legal analysis of the program, uh, and even then they weren't allowed to discuss it uh, with their colleagues or their constituents in the way that the Supreme Court has always pointed to uh, in past cases uh, of ratification. Uh, the second point uh, is to go back to an exchange that you had, uh, Judge Lynch, with the government relating to the efficiency, uh, the question of efficiency. Uh, Professor Felton has explained, I think, quite clearly that uh, the government could uh, use targeted demands in a nearly instantaneous way uh, if it structured its arrangement with the telecommunications companies in a certain way, and Congress certainly could provide uh, for that mechanism. Uh, even, uh, and, and the fact that Congress has not yet provided for that mechanism is no bar to this court ruling that it must. That was precisely the case in Katz uh, when the Supreme Court ruled that the government could not wiretap individuals without a warrant, and it led to the enactment of Title III. And that was precisely the case in Keith when the Supreme Court ruled uh, that foreign intelligence surveillance, uh, even though justified by uh, the need to gather intelligence, had to be individualized. Um, the third quick point is that uh, Smith is very different from this case for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's not just that the government is acquiring different types of information under this program that it was acquiring under Smith. It's not just that the government is acquiring the information about millions of individuals and not just uh, one, but it's also that the government is acquiring that information even with respect to a single person indefinitely, uh, for an indefinite duration. And not made clear just a few years after Smith uh, that when the government scales up a surveillance operation from targeted to dragnet, the constitutional uh, balance is different and needs to be addressed differently. Uh, and I think, uh, Judge Broderick, you are exactly right that Katz uh, now requires this court to assess uh, the expectations of privacy of this program uh, and not just of, of what the Supreme Court decided uh, in knots. A, a quick related point is that the minimization procedures that the government heavily relies on would be constitutionally superfluous uh, if Smith governed this case. They could collect the records without any of those uh, protections in place. They could store all of them indefinitely. They could query them for any reason or no reason at all. Uh, and they could build the dossiers that they disclaim building in this case with no constitutional restriction. Uh, a final point is that the government tries to explain uh, why it's only asking for a narrow ruling from this court. Uh, but the legal theories that it advances are a roadmap to a world in which the government routinely collects vast quantities of information uh, about Americans who have done absolutely nothing wrong. I don't think that's the world that Congress envisioned when it enacted Section 215, and it's certainly not the world uh, that the framers envisioned when they crafted the Fourth Amendment. If there are no questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we very much appreciate the arguments of both sides, uh, which were uh, uh, extremely uh, careful, thorough, and learned, and we will take them uh, uh, under advisement uh, and eventually uh, render a decision. Uh, thank you all very much. That's the last case on the calendar. The clerk will adjourn the court. Court stands adjourned.